This is the Eye on Annapolis Daily News Brief, keeping you informed about the happenings in Annapolis and the area. Local news, local sports, local events, local opinion, and of course, local weather. The Eye on Annapolis Daily News Brief starts now. Good morning. It's Wednesday, April 17th, 2019. This is John Frenet, and this is your Eye on Annapolis Daily News Brief. Following up on a story out of Glen Burnie, on April 15th at 7.10 a.m., as we told you, Anne Arundel County Police responded to a call for shots fired in the 170 block of Virginia Lane in Glen Burnie. When police arrived, they found a man suffering from what appeared to be a gunshot, and he has been identified as Tyreek Hudson, 22, of that address. Witnesses told police that they observed the suspect standing over the victim's body and that the two had had an ongoing issue. The witnesses did not know what the issue was about, but they did say that the suspect may have returned into the apartment building and barricaded himself. A standoff ensued, and at approximately 5 p.m., members of Anne Arundel County's quick response team were able to take the suspect into custody without any additional casualties, and he's been identified as James Allen Verombeck, also of the 100 block of Virginia Lane, a different apartment, obviously, than the victim. Verombeck is 53. The victim was 22 years old. Verombeck has been charged with first-degree murder, second-degree murder, firearm use in a felony, reckless endangerment, first- and second-degree assault. However, the Capitol dug up some interesting information in that Verombeck had had several protective orders taken out against him in the past, one as recently as February by the very victim that is dead at this point. That order was denied by a district court judge in February who was not available for comment to the Capitol. Also following up on a story from a few weeks ago, if you'll remember, a Millersville man was flown to shock trauma after accidentally lighting himself on fire as he was burning leaves in a burn pit. Joseph Willinger, 78, of the 500 block of Ski Lane, apparently has died from his injuries. He died yesterday, and he's the third person in Anne Arundel County to die from a fire-related injuries. Witnesses say that he had attempted to bolster a legal fire pit with gasoline, and when the fuel vapors ignited, they ended up burning Mr. Willinger. More woes for Annapolis Mayor Gavin Buckley. After six months, Mayor Gavin Buckley's city attorney abruptly resigned. And now, after just six weeks, his acting city attorney is calling it quits with a 10-day notice. The mayor's office sent out a notice about the resignation after the close of business yesterday. And in the statement, Buckley said... Linda was brought in to help with my proposal to reorganize some elements of city government as we came into the budget season. I am disappointed she is not going to take the job permanently or stick around longer, but I am grateful she lent us her expertise in writing the language to implement the proposed reorganization and procurement law changes I seek. Schuett's last day will be April 26th. Now, the city attorney position pays about 140 grand a year, so it's pretty much a plum position. And Schuett was no stranger to municipal law as she was the Anne Arundel County attorney from 99 through 2006. And she had worked extensively with city manager Teresa Sutherland when Sutherland was the auditor for Anne Arundel County. Now, in addition to the city attorney, Buckley still needs to fill the positions of chief of police and director of planning and zoning. And perhaps the most important piece of news this morning, Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookies, there is a recall. Certain packages of the chewy Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookies are being recalled because of, get this, an unexpected solidified ingredient that has been found in some of them. Mondelez International announced the recall saying that, quote, some reports of potential adverse health effects have been received. The company said it is specifically looking for 13-ounce packages of Chips Ahoy Chewy Cookies. The expiration dates would be September 7th, 8th, 14th, and 15th of 2019. And if you have one of those, the UPC code that you're looking for is 044-000-032234. company says if you have them, don't eat them. Call 844-366-1171. For more information, and I do want to point out that the Girl Scouts never did this for you. All right, that is about it for the top news. You want to hang out? I do have an opinion piece on the shenanigans surrounding the replacement of Speaker Bush here in Annapolis as our delegate. We also have George Young with your local DMV weather forecast, and he's coming up in just a minute after this brief message all about my friends in Severna Park, Mac Medics. Have you ever been to the Annapolis Mall when it opens for the day? Maybe you've noticed the line of folks waiting to get into the Apple Store. As you may know, I'm a Mac user, and today's episode of the Daily News Brief, in fact, all of the episodes of the Daily News Brief, have been produced right here on my Mac computer. 
What you might not know about is Macmedics. They were founded here in Annapolis in 1989, and they are an Apple-authorized premium service provider, the only one in the Baltimore, Annapolis, D.C. area. And what that means to you is that they repair all Apple devices, including the iPhone screens and batteries, all without an appointment. And most repairs are done the same day, usually within two hours. They also sell everything except the iPhone and the watch for the same price as Apple. I don't know why you would go anywhere else. Give them a call at 410-757-MACS, or if you're not into the whole letter thing, 410-757-6227. Stop by their retail store in Severna Park on Benfield Road, or their service center in Lanham, right off of Route 50. Or you can always check them out online at macmedics.com. I'll tell you, they've saved me quite a few times, and I know they can save you. Going out? You need the most up-to-date local weather. Here's George Young from DMV Weather in Annapolis with today's forecast. Hey everyone, this is George with DMV Weather, and this is your Eye on Annapolis forecast for Wednesday, April 17th. Yesterday worked out nicely, especially in the afternoon hours when winds died down even more across all of Anne Arundel County. And today will be much the same with highs in the 60s before jumping up nicely into the 70s on Thursday before rain moves into the region Friday with temps again in the 70s. And we'll need to watch out for more potential severe storms with this next storm Friday, though the overall risk factor isn't as solid as what we just had Sunday night into Monday morning. Beyond that, some rain may persist into early Saturday a.m., but the outlook remains good for the rest of Saturday and for Easter Sunday as well, with plenty of sunshine expected, with temp Sunday into the mid to upper 60s, if not lower 70s, if we're lucky. Okay, that's it for today. This is George Young of DMV Weather. Make it a great day out there, and be sure to get our free app on all of your devices by searching for DCMDVA Weather in the Apple or Google App Stores, and also follow us on Facebook and Twitter and on our website at dmvweather.com so you can always stay weather-informed. Join Anne Arundel Medical Center Foundation on Saturday, April 27, 2019, at our Denim and Diamonds Bash in Annapolis. Denim and Diamonds is a fun evening under the stars, featuring fabulous cuisine and gourmet food trucks, live and silent auction, and a live band. Last year, AAMC cared for more than 2,000 patients in our emergency departments suffering from mental illness or addiction. Help us expand much-needed inpatient and outpatient programs and services for your community. For tickets and sponsors, visit aamcdenimanddiamonds.org. Special thanks to our platinum sponsors, AAMC Medical Staff, the Chesapeake Bayhawks, Comcast, the Evan K. Thallenberg family, What's Up Media, and WRNR. So many different stories in the news, and everyone has an opinion. Here's ours. When former delegate Herb McMillan decided not to run for re-election, he minced no words about why. He was no longer willing to put up with the political machine evident on both sides of the aisle, with Steve Shue and Nick Kipke leading the Republicans and Mike Miller and Mike Bush on the Democratic side. One might have thought with the death of Speaker Bush that the political machine might be running on a few less cylinders. Well, if you had thought that, you would be wrong. Freshman legislators Senator Sarah Elfrith and Delegate Alice Kane have emerged as the self-appointed kingmakers in Annapolis politics and taken up the mantle. They have hand-picked a candidate in Shanika Henson to replace Speaker Bush and appear to be mounting a full-court press to see that it happens. I first learned about this push on Monday, April 8th. Do the math. As I mentioned in my April 11th opinion piece, go have a listen if you missed it. It's on the Daily News Brief. It was Thursday, April 11th. It is now in the best interest of the political hangers-on of the Central Committee to appease these two now-veteran legislators who have a combined 180 days experience. After all, they likely will need their support when they eventually run for office. I read an article on the website, A Minor Detail, where Delegate Alice Kane, with her 90 days of legislative experience, dissuaded a candidate because of his lack of experience. The irony wasn't lost on me. But the backroom shenanigans are upsetting. When other Democrats in other districts were discussing potential candidates, apparently Senator Elfrith got wind of the discussions, contacted them, and telling them to keep their nose out of her district. And that would be a quote. Elfrith has not shied from her support for Henson, and she has said that she is not telling the Central Committee on how to vote. This is true. She does not get a vote, nor does Delegate Kane. But as I said last week, most of that committee are political wannabes and might need the assistance of the senator and delegate in the future. Even more disturbing is that the Central Committee seems to be doing what it can to thwart any type of transparency. There are more than a dozen names in the running, and they claim to be interviewing all 
candidates at 6 p.m. on the 25th of April in a community center located well outside of the legislative district. Why so far away, guys? They also aren't allowing any public input other than comments that would be emailed to them, but they are due no later than noon on the 25th. So if you do want to support anybody, noon on the 25th is your deadline. So how deeply can you evaluate all candidates in just a few hours? Not too deeply. But then again, they may not be wading into the deep end here. In fact, the water is pretty shallow. And as I said last week, I suspect the choice has already been made. But the motions need to be gone through to remain, quote, transparent, unquote, and legal. Without the quotes, it does need to be legal. The process is flawed, and it's geared to encourage these types of backroom deals. There has to be a better way. A special election? Maybe go back to the other candidates that did not come out in one of the top two spots. After all, it was less than six months ago that we did have an election. Strange that the chair of the Central Committee lost a delegate primary race the last time around, and when Ted Sophocles died, he was lobbying hard for them to appoint him as the next closest finisher. But I suppose things have changed this time around. Oh, that's right. He's not in the race. Again, look back to the primary election for Annapolis mayor when Zena Pierre defeated Josh Cohen and then backed out. There were six people vying for that spot on the ballot. The Central Committee in Annapolis held a, quote, public meeting that lasted all of 20 minutes to announce that they selected Josh Cohen. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Meeting adjourned. Incidentally, Josh was the heir apparent in that election, and former Mayor Ellen Moyer had seen to it that the salary was increased to a level to support Cohen and his family. Zena was not even supposed to win that primary. Whoops. This is replaying all over again. Typically, the Central Committee is a nothing electric office. They meet monthly for cheerleading meetings for their respective parties, but the Constitution of Maryland does indeed give them special power in rare circumstances, and here we are. What do you know about the members of any Central Committee? Probably not too much. I did speak to one of the members of the committee who told me that the majority of the membership was leaning towards supporting the delegation's choice. Expected. One member said that they would vote for anybody as long as they were African-American, and there were a couple that they said were on the fence. And you know what's particularly distressing? I spoke to two very qualified candidates who, in my mind, would be outstanding delegates, but both of them are considering not running because of this bullshit. I guess we're going to have to wait and see who's chosen on the 25th, and since gambling is legal here in Maryland, my bet is on Shanika by a long shot. Yes, folks, the machine is alive and well. Speaker Bush prided himself on being fair, but partisan, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I wonder right now if the speaker would be proud or horrified. And that's what I'm thinking today. You've been listening to the Eye on Annapolis Daily News Brief. Tell your friends and colleagues this is the podcast where you can keep up on the latest with what's going on in Annapolis. And also tell them about our website, ionanapolis.net, where you can find even more information. This podcast comes to you every Monday through Friday at 7 a.m., keeping you informed with the Eye on Annapolis Daily News Brief. And take a moment to listen to our other podcast, The Maryland Crabs, released every Thursday at noon.